so this is uh, you know today I'm mostly uh, what I want to talk about is uh, solar thermal and uh, uh, I'll give you some more references on Tenfilm but we have already covered uh, most of it and we spend most of the time talking about solar thermal which is the other kind of solar which you don't usually hear about so uh, so we have covered this chart pretty much in its uh, entirety in the last uh, you know, last few weeks. So we have talked about uh, multi-junction cells which are at the higher end of this pyramid. Right? We have talked about what happens to them when you use them under concentration and this is what happens to them if you use that one cell. Then we talked about, uh, or even before that, we talked about uh, um, these uh, crystalline silicon based cells and we spent you know quite a few weeks talking about these crystalline silicon technology and then we focused our attention on these different six based technology a different thin film technology starting with CIGS which has the highest efficiency among all these six technology then CAT 10 which is uh, slightly below that and then finally amorphous silicon which is kind of a black sheet and doesn't give you very high efficiency and then at, in the last class we talked about organic uh, organic solar cells which are at the very bottom of this pyramid so you know if you think of this as a pyramid you start at the top with the uh, with the multi-junction cell and at the very bottom of this pyramid you have uh, your organic cells over here but these are very promising as we discussed last time because the efficiency if you compare the slope among all these different technologies, we seem to have the highest slope of uh, rate of increase of the efficiency. The one thing which I have not covered and intentionally left out is this uh, dye sensitized cell and it is uh, covered in one of the problem sets in one of the questions where you watch a video of a person making a dye sensitized cell and it's very easy to use, it's made using you know, things like raspberries and strawberries you mix them and make these cells. So it's a fun video if you get time to review what's that in the class. So uh, these are some more references. So you know where I think uh, you can uh, go and uh, dive deeper if you are so inclined or if you are confused and you want to see where I picked up most of the material from. So most of the different materials on different six technology I have mostly picked up from this uh, handbook of photovoltaics and uh, the chapter dedicated to each of them and uh, each and then there are some handouts which are uh, placed on the class website as well so there's a handout which talks about how do you pick the material uh, such that uh, they are good candidates for 10 film PV so you, they should be cheap they should be readily available they should be good absorbers there's a, another handout which is a very good handout on thin film silicon, both amorphous and multicrystalline uh, silicon. And then there's this another article which is kind of an overview article as well. It's, uh, it's slightly old, it was written in 2005. So it's written by Enwell, but it talks about the, uh, if PV technologies were ever to achieve a terawatt kind of capacity, then uh, you know, what all they need to do to. Uh, to for that to happen so you know what I want to talk today is uh, something which was not captured on that chart so you know that chart was all about different photovoltaic technology but uh, photo I mean that's not the only way to convert uh, sunlight to uh, the sunlight to uh, uh, electricity right the other way would be to heat up water or heat up something and then use it to you know drive a steam engine or drive a uh, turbine to uh, convert it into electricity and that is what is called as solar thermal sometime uh, it's called solar thermal some other people call it as CSP or concentrated uh, solar power and both of them essentially are the same thing sometimes I'd like to use solar thermal because if you use concentrated solar power it could also mean concentrated for uh, uh, for these multi-junction cells, right? So those people might complain that you are stealing our thunder. So solar thermal is uh, is a more uh, uh, is the name that I like to use, but some other people call it CSP. So CSP and solar thermal mean the same thing. 
and if you want to distinguish it from uh, uh, distinguish it from uh, multi-junction uh, concentrated cells, and those are called as a CPV. So there's CPV and CSP, but CSP and solar thermal are the same thing, right? So I just want to ask three of you that you know what, what when do you think that the peak load occurs, right? That you have you know you start your day at six, seven, eight. If you're a graduate student, maybe you know, 10, 11 a.m. and then it goes way all the way down into you know, late in the night. So when do you think the maximum load occurs? You know, in what time range? And so this would be you know the sun going up and down. And actually, if you have a good tracking, this would be your solar power generation, where it starts maybe at around. 7 a.m. It ends around 5, 6 p.m. Right? When do you think the on, so this is just the sunlight uh, curve, solar irradiation, but how would the peak curve look? Would it be on the right side of it? Would it be on the left side of it? On the left meaning uh, like this. So would it be this? Or would it be this? Or would it be, you know, something like that? You think what are you? So this is, uh, you know, this is plotting load as a function of time. Right, so the total uh, power in the grid as a function of time. So does it overlap exactly with the uh, with the position of the sun, or does it overlap with the solar irradiance? Is it red shifted or is it blue shifted? I mean, red shifted means going towards the. Red shifted means going uh, on the on the on the right side, left. Or blue shifted means going on the left side. But anyway, you can you know look at these uh, one, two, three, and tell me what it. Where one is this, two is this guy. Okay, and then three. Let's say this guy. So I mean, three looks like a reasonable assumption because you know most people don't end their day at five. You drive back home, right? You have you cook dinner, you watch television. All those things consume uh, electricity. Or uh, even if you go to retail stores, right? If you are in Vegas, you know the load would look exactly different, right? But uh, you know, most of the retail or even commercial spaces, they'll still, you know, consume uh, load much beyond after the sunlight, right? Especially if you have street lighting, which goes on. So the load, actually, let me show you the load profile. How does it look? So it looks exactly like this. So you have this yellow curve is for a system which is tracking the sun, you know, very closely in uh, both axes. And the brown curve, the bigger curve, is what the uh, what the actual load in the grid looks like. So this is what the actual load in the uh, grid looks like. So you have some stabilizing load over here, which is generated by uh, you know things like nuclear, which you can't turn up and down quickly. And then you add solar to it to you know, account for that peak. But this this peak load in the grid is still uh, is still red shifted with respect to with respect to your uh, with respect to your solar um, your your solar uh, uh, energy coming into your so, so is that, is that just or yeah. so i'm i'm talking about 
electric uh, uh, this is plotting the electric load in the grid heating is mostly still I mean, not well, few places it is electric but most of the time you use gas for that right so that does not get accounted into this part. but heating load is, is exactly different it's more in the night and you know, less in the night. Yeah. but that's not captured on the grid it's mostly off so you immediately see a problem, right? That your load in the grid is not is, is shifted, time shifted with respect to the solar energy. And unless you are storing this energy in a battery, you know you, you are not meeting your grid requirement, right? So a big uh, selling point, at, at least for uh, solar thermal, is that you can dispatch your power, so you can store it for a few hours and then dispatch it a few hours later. I'll, I'll explain how that's done. But you can time shift this energy easily by a uh, couple of hours and at maximum by six, seven hours. So you you know you can store it and then feed it into the grid when you need to. So this is what the what's the main selling point of uh, of uh, of uh, solar thermal that you have this green curve which corresponds to the solar uh, uh, this red curve which corresponds to the solar energy and then you can transform it into this uh, uh, green curve so you can shift it on a time scale by a few hours okay and then you can you know appropriately adjust depending upon like even between summer and winter how the load is changing and you can uh, accordingly shift your you know so it, I'm um, electrical engineer. I like to think of things as you know, linear time invariant. So you can introduce a phase shift as you want. Right. So it turns out this uh, solar thermal is is in fact nothing new. You know, in fact, it's it's the oldest uh, solar technology that has been around. And uh, this is uh, showing a picture from uh, 1914. Uh, this was by this American inventor Frank Schumann, and he built a lot of these uh, uh, CSP or these solar thermal systems. This is uh, he built the first one in Egypt, then he built a lot of them in England, and they were running all the way till World War uh, One. And during World War One, you know, there was suddenly a lot of cheap coal available, especially in England in Newcastle. So they, you know, this, this suddenly became uneconomical, but. This was the first uh, solar energy, the first method, so the first form in which you know solar energy was uh, harnessed uh, to make uh, electricity. So oh, shown here is you know is, is his system. It consists of these uh, parabolic uh, troughs, and there's a pipe running in the center of these, which is collecting the sunlight and you know heating up this pipe, and it's generating this uh, this turbine over here. And, you know, so this engine over here. And uh, Mark Schumann, you know, he was the true visionary or a true pioneer at that time. You know, in 1914, much before Bell Lab invented uh, uh, its first cell, solar cell, or much, you know, much even before uh, people knew how to explain photons and electrons, he was already talking about uh, uh, talking about uh, harnessing the energy of the sun, and he one of his quotes. So. One thing I feel for sure, and that is that the human race might finally utilize direct sun power. So he already knew that you know, it's direct sunlight that you need to harness, not diffuse. Direct sun power to revert to barbarism, or, or sorry, the utilize direct sun power or revert to barbarism. And he's talking about you know all the wars that were going around at that time, mostly around you know getting the sources of energy. He recommend in 1914, didn't seem like much people listened to him, but I recommend that all far-sighted engineers and inventors work in this direction for their own profit and the eternal welfare of the humankind. It has been almost a century, not, um, but finally it seems like solar thermal is picking up, and I, I'll show you a lot of illustrations today. Uh, and I, I especially like it, this field more. It's not covered as much as um, in other solar courses, but it's a very important thing to understand. It's a very fast growing field. Uh, 